Oh. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bartow History Museum. I am normally not the one that's up here introducing, but unfortunately, it was Trey's turn to host Rotary, so that's where he is. <laughs> but for those of you that don't know, I am Lauren Story Rhodes, and I'm the marketing manager here at the Bartow History Museum. And it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, and Isla, and Hi. she is the manager of geology programs at TELUS, which is our sister museum right up the road. So, um, as I said, she's the geology program manager at TELUS, and she's passionate about science education and teaching people about science on all levels. Uh, before uh, working at TELUS, she actually began teaching, I believe. She worked as a science teacher. I did, teacher. yeah, I was a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and then she moved on to delivering public programming at Zoo Atlanta and Georgia Aquarium, mm -hmm. which I believe Talk about penguins, yeah. <laughs> she currently serves as Georgia State Representative of the National Association of Geoscience Teachers and works to promote geoscience um, education for students at every level in our state. She holds a bachelor's degree from Georgia Tech in Earth and Atmospheric Science mm -hmm. and a master's in science education from the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So she is very, very well qualified to teach you about what she's going to talk about today. Hey. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hannah. Oh, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Well, hi, I'm so glad to see everybody here today. Thank you for having me. It's fun. So uh, I, I got asked to do this a couple months ago as the process for looking for lunch and learn speakers goes. Um, all the museums that are doing this, it's like, who should we have? And I was chatting um, with somebody on staff here and they were like, you know, we did that thing last summer where we went and picked up rocks. You should come talk about that. And I was like, that doesn't sound that exciting. Maybe we can make it a little more. Uh, but we are going to talk about that a fair amount because it was really fun, but we're not going to focus on that completely. And so I kind of expanded it out to talking about just materials in Bartow in general. And if you've been in Bartow County for any length of time, you know that this is a mining place, right? And we, so there's that aspect of our materials that are very important. Um, there are a lot of folks who are experts in the mining history of Bartow County, so I'm really just going to touch on a lot of that and not go into too much detail because it's not my area of expertise. Um, but we're just going to kind of survey the history of how people have used the land here in Bartow County. Um, so to start with, look, it's Bartow County, right? So exciting. It's, Bartow is so unique because of how it's all laid out, right? Where the land is, the fact that it has been because of where it lays, um, it has really served as a good crossroads for how people move through Northwest Georgia and Georgia in general um, for a very long time. And so that makes it so unique. And then having access to water, having access to different kinds of landscapes, it's all encompassed here in this space in Bartow County, which is pretty cool. So specifically from a geologic perspective, this happens because Bartow is the intersection of three of the regions we have here in Georgia. So when we talk about Georgia's regions. Sometimes you see ecoregions. If you're into um, ecology, if you're like plants and animals, there's ecoregions break down on a much finer level um, than our geologic regions. But when we talk about our geologic regions, um, there are five in the state of Georgia. Three of them have representative areas here in Bartow County. So that's kind of important, right? That's pretty unique. Um, the majority of Bartow is this green bit right, is in the Valley and Ridge region. The Valley and Ridge has sedimentary rocks, and because it bumps up against this fault line that goes up and cre helped um, be part of the creation of the Appalachian Mountains way back in the day when they were taller than the Himalayas, as far as we know, right, we, best guess is they were probably taller than the Himalayas. Um, because of that fault line, we have these sedimentary rocks that were formed in the bottom of an ocean that used to lay over where Bartow County is. So we have all of this material that was laid down in a marine, in an ocean environment. And then over time, because of that fault, that kind of got tilted up and pushed. And then the important, the really important thing for the mining industry here in Bartow is that all along this fault line, because it's a fault, faults don't happen and aren't neat areas where things just blithely glide past each other, right? It was a very violent and a very breaking um, a lot of um, creation happened in that space for all those materials. And so all these rocks got broken up, and because they were still sitting there, that allowed for other things to come in and fill in the space. And so things like all of these minerals that we find happen 
kind of tightly grouped um, with some exceptions, relatively close to that fault line, and it's because they were there, that space was there so that all that um, production was happening. You have all these cracks, you have all of this metamorphism, because you've got metamorphic rock in the Blue Ridge region and in the Piedmont region, um, including there's metagranite actually along the edge of Lake Alatuna. So metamorphic rock is formed with intense heat and pressure, right? It may have been intense heat where like lava came in and then the rocks around it that didn't get melted got turned into something else. Or it might have been just from the pressure of those parts of rocks, those tectonic plates pushing together. So you end up with all of this space and all of this deformation and all of this change happening in southern Bartow County. And it made space for all these minerals to take root and then become what is now the Cartersville Mining District, right? If you don't have this unique nature of that part of Bartow County, you don't have the mining like what we see. So it makes for some interesting stuff that can be found at the surface and then also if you dig underground, right, which is cool. So prior to the 1800s, there were people in Bartow County, right? Um, we know there were people here probably since um, the Paleo-Indian period. Um, there's not a ton of evidence for that, but given the, geo the geography of the area, the availability of water, what we know were routes through the space, there were probably people here. Um, we have evidence for people being here during the Woodland period and then on into the Mississippian period with the mound builders at Etowah Indian Mounds, right? So there were people in the space, and then there was really pretty much continuous use of the land in Bartow County by somebody um, prior to the um, land lottery for land in for the gold lots, right? And then subsequently the removal of the Cherokee and the Muscogee Creek people because of the Trail of Tears, right, through that space. So we know there were people here using the land and a lot of that evidence for that can be found at places like the Etowah Indian Mound site or the Leaky Mound site here in, Car here in um, Cartersville and in Bartow County, which are down here. That's what this space all is. Those are fish weirs on this picture that were in the Etowah River. This is a map from the Etowah Valley Historical Society, if anybody is wanting to look this up for yourselves later. So um, a couple of years ago, TELUS actually featured a lot of information about the materials that were found at the Etowah Indian Mound site um, that can be found in Bartow County and then in the Ridge and Valley and up into the Blue Ridge in general. So within a, a reasonable amount of distance away from the site. Uh, and did anybody get to go see that one? It was called From Clay to Copper. I don't know if anybody got a chance to see it. It was fabulously curated. And because TELUS is a Smithsonian affiliate, um, we actually had materials that came from the Smithsonian's collection that we were displaying as part of that as well. Um, because the, the Etowah Indian Mound site, a lot of the material that has been unearthed there is either in the Georgia Department of Natural Resources control, right? Like they're holding it in their collections, or it got given to the Smithsonian and it's in the Smithsonian's control in DC. And we're talking like trays and trays and trays of projectile points and pottery shards and ritual materials and all kinds of things that are sitting in, in collection in DC at the Smithsonian. Um, so to, as part of creating that exhibit, our team kind of cross-referenced where materials that were at the site that have been found at the site that are in the Smithsonian's collection uh, or in DNR's collection, where those, uh, what kinds of materials those were made from. And then we found a lot of very similar things that we can demonstrate that are in our local area. So Bartow is actually, let's see here, where's the top edge of it? Oh, this picture's hard to see. It goes like across there and comes down right because it does carry over this edge with the um the red edge on here is the edge of the valley and ridge region um and then you can see here's lake alatuna right the gold um diamond is the etowah indian mound site and so there's there are a lot of materials found at the site um there's also evidence at the etowah indian mound site for how extensive the trade network was that they were part of at the time um there's material at the site that came from Michigan. There are materials that came from, actually there's one thing in particular, oh, I forget what, what I was told. There's one piece of material in particular that's in the collection for the DNR that's actually on display at the museum over at the Indian Mound site that's material that probably came from as far away as La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles. So for it to have come that far is just real stunning, 
right? Um, that's fabulously impressive that it came that far. But a lot of it was materials that people were just looking around and finding laying on the ground in their backyard or at specific locations where um, they knew to pull material for this. So um, we're going to talk about a couple of the ones that are particularly cool and that you can find pretty easily if you go out looking here in Bartow County. Um, the first one is all the pigments that were used. So of course, if we're talking about paint and pigment at the time, that's coming from mineral sources or it's coming from biologic sources like berries, right? But the ones that have good staying power are the ones that are coming from mineral sources. And we have an an embarrassment of good stuff for that in Bartow County. Um, the big ones are ochre, hematite, and uh, graphite. And actually, the so these ancestral figures that are found that were found at the Etowah site that you can see if you go over to their museum, they're made out of Tate white marble from Tate, like they're white marble that was found locally and then created, carved into these images. But then they're painted. With, with mineral-based paints that have stood the test of time and lasted because of the way that they were formulated and the way they put them on these pieces. So this black-gray color is actually mostly coming from graphite, um, and we have graphite here in Bartow. You can find it uh, over in Emerson. There's a couple of places where there are some cuts where you can find graphite. Um, the red color that's on their ears and on their around their lips um, is mostly hematite, and that's iron ore, so that's coming from materials that we also have here, or would, would have been in even more abundance prior to when mining took hold here in Bartow County, right? A lot of the stuff has been taken out. And then, of course, ochre, I mean, New Riverside is still mining ochre, right? So we have ochre um, in the area as well. That's more of a brown, yellow, like a mustardy brown color when you make it into kind of a pigment paint. Um, last summer, we got real brave and we were doing a program, part of what facilitated this whole, like the look, going to look for rocks, um, is that we had a partnership with a researcher from Emory, a PhD researcher from Emory University, who was trying to look at how children could learn to make stone tools. It was part of her dissertation research, a larger part. Um, but to try to tie it into Bartow, we talk, started learning more about the Etowah Indian mines and mounds, sorry, Etowah Indian mounds and bringing that material in. And we were, we were possibly stupid brave. We let children paint with ochre and hematite that may or may not have been a terribly good choice. There were a lot of very red things in my, in my lab space at the museum. Very red, the hematite. I warned my staff, I was like, y'all, if you don't like, if the hematite gets on your clothes, it's not coming out, you have been warned, right? Because it's extremely red. Um, <laughs> it's gonna stay for forever, but that's so cool that these are mineral-based things that were, would have been found in the area. I mean, ochre has been used in particular as a paint source for a very long time, different um, places to find it, but the fact that there was one local for these people to use, they weren't sourcing it from somewhere else. They were finding it in their own backyard, right, in their local area, and that's very cool. Um, another cool one is using the metamorphic rocks that are on the edges of our area and then also up into the Blue Ridge or down into the Piedmont. Um, to make different objects because metamorphic rock is a lot more solid than sedimentary rock, right? Because it's gone through all of that intense heat and pressure. So it's not as good word, it's crumbly, right? Like if it gets exposed to air, it weathers very differently. Um, metamorphic rocks that everybody's really familiar with is marble, right? But the one that there's a couple of very pretty objects of at um, the Etowah site is phyllite. And we have phyllite here in Bartow. It's kind of down on the edge when you get into that Piedmont region edge down there below Emerson, going towards the lake. Um, there is phyllite. Um, it got used in several ceremonial objects because of how sturdy it is, but also because there's a lot of mica, the mineral mica, in phyllite, so it's very shiny or like pleasantly shiny. I would say it's pleasant, like it's got a nice sheen to it. It almost looks like it would feel soapy but then if you touch it, it doesn't feel that soapy. Um, so it's very pretty. And there were a lot of, there were several objects that were made out of phyllite that were at the Etowah site that you can see. Um, another one, the one that was our fun friend last summer was Chert, right? So Chert, who's actually heard of Chert before? Oh, okay, a couple people, okay. It's kind of hit or miss. Yeah, I know why you have, right? Uh, Lauren's cheating, y'all. But Chert can be a little hit or miss. 
people are like, Wah. people have more often heard of chert in all of the varietal names that it gets given. So things like flint. And if you really get into this with geologists, some of them get really, really twisted about whether or not we can call like is is flint chert or is it separate? But um, jasper is another variety, um, different things like that. It's basically just a way of describing rocks that are mostly made out of quartz that has cemented, sedimented together to form this material. And the thing about the quartz is quartz is hard, right? It's a Mohs hardness of seven. Um, so it's really hard and it breaks in this really special way called a conchoidal fracture. If you smack something into, into a piece of chert, into a piece of quartz and it shatters a piece off, you're gonna get this, this fracture point that looks kind of like a, the inside of a seashell and it can be very, very, very sharp. And I have a couple of pieces I'll pass around. This one in particular, I think, is the, is the sharpest one that I brought with me today. I'll start a couple. Here, you can have one of each of these pieces. We're going to talk about the other one in a second. Oh, no, I grabbed two grays. No, I got to grab a red. I'll start these over here for you. I teach science, y'all. We, we have to touch things. We can't not touch things. Um, so the chert, because of the way it forms um, and the fact that it's mostly quartz, um, it makes for pretty good tools. And so you find by and large that a lot of projectile points, if, they're, if they have access to chert, to flint, to jasper, that is what projectile points get made out of, right? And so there are a bunch of chert-based projectile points in Bartow County. I mean, people, one of the things that last summer, people were just bringing me like, my dad has this whole bag of projectile points he picked up on the farm you know, here you go, and they were just giving them to me. It's like, cool, we're gonna use them for education, it's great. Um, so this is actually the site where we picked up that darker, the flinty material, the darker chert that you guys are looking at. Um, just a creek bed in Adairsville. It's from Adairsville, right? It was somebody's farm. We walked out of a creek bed because it was just full of this. And we, the piece up here, you guys can see looks really similar to those darker ones that you guys are passing around. This is a piece that's sitting at the Smithsonian right now. So this rock that clearly, if you look at it, looks like it came, probably came from Bartow County, right? Is sitting in a drawer at the Smithsonian as part of their collection because it was from this Etowah site, right? So that's pretty cool. The Jasper also, um, this one, I think that one more looks like this piece I have. Y'all see how like dark red gray this one is? I think that picture looks more like that. Um, but the Jasper, this is, this is a hill in a neighborhood that was still under construction, probably still is under construction, um, in Kingston. This is just the top of a hill under power line. And it's just sitting there. It's where we got this from, right? That it's just here hanging out in Bartow County, which is so cool. So all these materials, we have all of this, we have evidence, right? We can see where they found these kinds of things here in Bartow and then how it got used, which is very cool. So um, after the land lottery, we move into when mining starts to be a bigger ish deal for Bartow County, right? First it's gold um, with the gold rush from starting in about 1829, the Alatuna, all right, nope, sorry. I got ahead of myself a slide. Okay, so here are all the things you can find in Bartow County. <laughs> here are all the things that have historically been mined in some capacity or used in some capacity that can be found in Bartow County. It's a lot. Bartow's not like, that doesn't have any of the superlatives like the most productive place, but it's very, it's one of the most, right? Like it's a very productive area for mining. It's a very unique um, region in terms of the mi mineral um, wealth that's available. And so you can just see all kinds of stuff, right? And so like we talked about, there's the Cartersville Fault running down and you can see the barite and the iron are really, really concentrated right there around that because all that breaking, all of that metamorphosis, we end up with all of that space for those materials to come in and clump up and fill up in that space and, and be there. Um, the gold along the bottom edge by the Alatoon and we're gonna talk about that next. Granite is an igneous rock, so there would have had to have been some amount of a lava pool there at some point, not necessarily a volcano, but there was lava in that space that cooled underground um, to make granite. Uh, and then limestone, limestone and shale are both 
sedimentary rocks. So those are laying on that other side of the county uh, where we're getting our, our ridge and valley, right? The sedimentary rocks are on that side. So that, that first thing that was getting um, pulled in Bartow was gold, right? So the gold rush in Georgia began in 1829. Um, the, by all accounts, there was available gold in Bartow, not a ton, right? It was not as rich as the veins they were finding up in Dahlonega. So that's why you see more of the like wholesale mining for gold happening up towards Dahlonega. But there was gold here. People were, were mining for it, were finding it in this area, um, even into the 1930s. Uh, at this point, the vein is not accessible because it's under Lake Alatoona, right? It was very close to the town of Etowah, which is no more, right? And is under Lake Alatoona. So you can't actually get to the vein where the gold was found um, anymore. But it was here, which is cool. Um, iron, of course, is the one that everybody's very familiar with. If you've been to Cooper's Furnace, at the day use area, right? And seen that. Um, for starting in the 1830s with the Stroops and then carrying on into the last mining was happening in the late 50s, 1950s, um, with it getting processed into the 1960s. So I have 60, what I have, I have it ending in 60s, but it, they may have actually stopped in the late 50s. It's kind of close there. Um, but so for a very long time, iron was a very, very important resource here in Bartow. Um, and it's because that whole area along that Cartersville Mining District had so much available um, to be able to, to mine out and, uh, and have that way. I think the interesting, one of the interesting parts is that this, um, this industry in general, in particular, was targeted by Sherman as he marched to the sea, right, going through Georgia, because they knew there was iron manufacturing happening in the area, and they specifically raised all of that to the ground to make sure it couldn't continue, right? So that's why the town of Etowah was just totally destroyed um, and in that march. And all that's left at this point that we have evidence for is Cooper's Furnace. So, and anecdotal things, lots of anecdotal things. This, if you see a chunk of this laying around, it's not a meteorite, you guys. It's not a meteorite. That is, I think, probably 75% of the ID calls we get at the museum are somebody being like, I think I found a meteorite, it's magnetic. And we're like, where are you? You're in Bartow, it's iron. <laughs> like 75% of, I think, of our calls. I actually had one for graphite the other day. I felt very special. We don't get ones that are not iron very often. So I got graphite. I was real, I was so, so fun. Um, but you, especially when you find, when you're finding iron that still exists all over the place here in Bartow County, right? A lot of times you're finding pieces that have also already been um, developed at least a little bit. So they may look shinier because they were already melted and then left around as part of these processes, as part of these manufacturing processes. So there is a, there is a ton, a ton of leftover iron to be discovered in Bartow County, but not enough for profitable mining, which is why it's not happening anymore. And then as we move into the modern era, um, some of what we're doing has ceased, but it's still really important to talk about, um, and that's barite. So nobody is actively mining barite in Bartow County anymore. It's still being processed, but it's not being actively mined. And so um, New Riverside is still uh, was the last one that mined barite here in Bartow County. This site, does anybody recognize what this site is? If you look really carefully. Mm. Just zoom it in. So, make sure I point to the right thing. So there's City Hall. This is 41. So this is where the Publix is sitting now. Uh, what all's over here in the Academy Sports and Outdoors sitting right there? So this was an open barite mine in the 1970s that is now covered up with development. Um, Riverside kind of worked their way across towards 75 once 75 came through and completed. Um, and they wanted to be able to connect downtown Cartersville to the interstate and 41 over to the interstate. They started working their way across. And as they would do these open pit mines, they would reclaim it and cover it and then keep going. Um, very strategically, they would find a spot and work it and then reclaim it, and it would turn into something else. Um, I know there was an ochre one that's now where those two hotels are sitting behind 
the McDonald's right off of the Main Street exit. Like that was an ochre mine very recently, pretty recently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, barite goes into everything, right? So either barite um, solutions or uh, that's not the right word. My brain just dropped it. It's a science word, and I can't think of it. So like when you have to do barium for X-rays, that's barite that's been processed, right? Barite is in tennis shoes. Barite is in um, bowling balls. <laughs> barite is in um, paint. Like it's, it, it goes into paint materials. It's in all kinds of stuff. Depending on how it gets processed, it gets powdered and then mixed with different chemicals. Depending on how that all goes down, it's in all kinds of things. And barite, prior to the world wars, we were mainly getting chemical materials from Germany, actually, before World War I and World War II. But then when Germany was an enemy, right, we had to find resources that were more close to home. And that was really when barite mining in Bartow really took off. Prior to that, um, it was there, but barite's really heavy and it's not the easiest thing to process. It's, it's useful and ours is very rich and very fabulous, but here in Bartow County, but it's very dense and it's very heavy and it can be hard to work with. And so a lot of people were kind of avoiding it because that wasn't what, there weren't understandings for how to make it profitable yet here. But then when it, we needed a source for that kind of material during the World Wars, the production really ramped up and then has carried through into really recently. Um, Mr. Bearden from um, New Riverside said that their last mine closed in, 19, in 2019. So it's been that recent that we were, we're still doing barite open mining here in Bartow County, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's, in, it's just a wildly useful material that's in all kinds of things. <laughs> I also like to tell kids that you eat rocks constantly, right? Because a lot of um, powdered rock additives will get added to things, especially calcium carbonate, which is coming mostly from powdered marble, is in a lot of things you eat. So if you start looking, you will find a lot of times where you have ingested rocks in some capacity on a daily basis. Right, so <laughs> there's a lot. Um, the other one that's still being actively mined is limestone. Um, so the, this picture is of Lad's Quarry, where so an older um, edition of mining limestone here in, in Bartow. Vulcan is still mining limestone, but they're using it for aggregate at this point to add to different things. They're not using it for the same thing. When Lad's was mining it, it was actually getting turned into lime, and it was being used even to put the carbonation in Coca-Cola, which I think is fabulous. <laughs> so you can use limestone if you break it down for all kinds of things, but it, it was, it's been used um, that way. Now, not as much, but it's still being mined here in Bartow. And then uh, everybody's favorite, ochre, right? Ochre has been actively mined in Bartow County since the late 1870s. Um, and it is still being actively mined. Um, if you are driving um, from downtown 275 and you kind of hit that ridge when you're going by the new Kroger, right, and you look to the right and you can see a mountainside that's being mined out right now, that is ochre mining that New Riverside is doing currently that's actually still active here in, in the county. Um, new Riverside, in fact, has been in operation for over 100 years. Um, consistently, continually. Uh, they are one of the, they are, they are the longest operating ochre manufacturer in the Western Hemisphere, according to their website, right? So <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Uh, and originally when they started mining ochre in Bartow in the late 1800s, they were actually getting it out from underground. There are, um, there have been tunnels discovered as part of New Riverside's uh, this, um, exploration and excavation where they, can, they have found support beams from the 1890s that were part of these underground tunnels. Now, that's not the best idea because since ochre is mainly found in kind of very clay-heavy deposits, I feel like that was not the best location to put a mine, right? That's just asking to be destroyed and to, and to cave in on you. But it, it, it was still happening in that, that, at that time. Now they do open pit for it. Uh, and they're taking it out from above. So it's not being mined out from underground anymore, which is just as well. The, one of the people who started mining, um, J.W. Earl, 
the anecdotal story is that he was actually riding through Bartow on a train on the, on the Western and Atlantic and saw what he knew were ochre deposits and was interested in being in Bartow County and looking for ochre. Um, so it's, that's just, that's how rich the area is, which is, which is really astounding to learn about and to see. Um, so I could keep going for forever about different materials that are in Bartow because like I said, there's a lot. Bauxite is um, aluminum ore that was found over by Barnsley Gardens. It's not actively mined anymore, but it was. Um, saltpeter is on here because, just because of the Kingston Saltpeter Cave. Um, it was pretty much only tapped during the Civil War when the Confederacy needed saltpeter um, for war efforts, but it was in there. That's also the when they found the, the Kingston Saltpeter Cave and then the cave that was uncovered at Lad's Lime Quarry. Um, both were full of Cenozoic era fossils, like things from giant ground sloths and tapers and saber-toothed cats and jaguars and all kinds of amazing animals that are in there. Those also are mostly in the collection. Those fossils are mostly in the Smithsonian's collection, but we have some at the museum if you'd like to come see them over at TELUS um, that are representative of what was discovered in there. And uh, manganese also is usually right next to iron, and so when people realized that that's what it was, they started going in for the manganese. It's not actively mined anymore um, either, but it was an important material for quite a while. So all these things, granite, there's still some granite mining happening now, um, mostly for building materials or for um, also for aggregate. It gets used for that a lot, as filling in different things. So it's just really astounding to recognize what all is around you here in Bartow County and what can easily be recovered if you know what you're looking for and know where to look, right? And you can, you guys can see here's the here's 75. So place yourself where where you want to go, start wandering around and checking out. If you are going to do that though, right? Um, <laughs> Don't go on private property without permission. That's like rock, that's one of the big rock hounding ones. Uh, don't, don't go on somebody else's property without permission. Nobody likes that. Um, but if you do find something cool anywhere here in Bartow or beyond if, on your travels, come see us and show us at the museum, right? We love doing, we love chatting with folks about what they have found. We actually will have uh, several people dedicated to doing that at our Rock Fest event the second weekend in June. There'll be a whole tent with people sitting under it who want to identify things you find and bring to show us. So come see us. We would love, we would love to chat with you about, about Bartow and what you found. Do you guys have any questions? Does the Dillinger family still own the site? They do, yeah. They have been continuously in possession in some capacity since it started in the very early 1900s. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh yeah. So some of it is just natural weathering and erosion, right? Where other rocks that were other places got broken down and then carried to wherever you are. Some of it is leftover mining activity. I think a lot of people don't even realize what all might have been happening on or around their property at any given time. Because when you look at this map and how much material is available in the county and think about since the 1830s, people have actively been digging things out of the ground here somewhere, right? I mean, in some capacity, just nonstop. And so, I mean, even the Telus grounds, I believe were an, an iron or a manganese or both mine at some point. Like there are parts of our property that were also actively mined at some point in the past. Um, big, big iron mining uh, across the road from where the museum is. So, oh, okay. Uh-huh. Like, what is this? Chert, <laughs> limestone. <laughs> oh yeah. 
Yeah, it's so hard to get into the ground anywhere, especially over there by Lats, because my folks live that direction too. And it's just, there's so much, there are so many rocks. <laughs> You're getting nowhere. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, yeah. And then um, you also hear about umber, where they've processed the yellow ochre a little bit to make it into the next um, material down. So you, you hear umber get thrown in there also when you're talking about processing ochre. Second question is that you mentioned Mm-hmm. It's pretty much what was left over when people were heating things up in, in the forge. So like it might have been material that got to a point where they could have used it for that next level of processing, but it got lost or got discarded in some capacity or washed away. I mean, like we, you would be shocked the number of places people have found processed iron in, in Bartow County when we get all, we see all of it at the museum. So <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of pig iron, a lot of pig iron. Yeah. Well, it's iron ore in its natural state. Mm -hmm. It's semi-red. You'll it's see the oxidation, right, where the iron has interacted with the oxygen in the atmosphere, if there's any kind of surface. So you'll see that rustiness to it. So that usually makes it pretty easy to spot because of that. Like, it looks like, why is this rock rusty? Well, yeah, it's got iron in it. Iron mm -hmm. built trail out there at the red top. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of that, I'm assuming, that mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and even Red Top Mountain, actually the coolest thing about Red Top Mountain is that the very top of the mountain is some of the oldest rock in Georgia, if not the oldest rock in Georgia. Like we estimate that it's more than a billion years old sitting up on top of that mountain um, that's just been hanging out relatively undisturbed for all of this time, which is amazing to think about because everything else is a lot younger. The Piedmont, the... Um, the Ridge and Valley region and then the Cumberland Plateau are the young, or some of the younger rocks in Georgia. The youngest is all the stuff down in the coastal plain. But the Ridge and Valley and the, um, and the Appalachian Plateau formed during the Paleozoic era and then just got kind of pushed up and left alone while everything else got smushed to bits with the mountain forming event um, during the formation of Pangaea that would have made the um, Appalachian Mountains as tall if not taller than the Himalayas. So it makes for an interesting way to look. The other thing I didn't even mention, right, that you can find in rocks everywhere, some here in Bartow, but really as you go towards Rome, you'll just find more and more and more, is fossils, right? Because this is old sedimentary rock, there are so many fossils you can find. You go to any road cut that's sedimentary rock and you can just start picking and you'll start finding things. Brachiopods, crinoids, potentially even trilobites if you get really lucky. Um, up by Cloudland Canyon, there are a bunch of plant fossils that you can find from that Paleozoic era. So just stunning amounts of stuff. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's bryozoans and horn corals. I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. It was an ocean. This was an ocean, and then the Cumberland Plateau was a swamp, right? That's why it was an ocean with a swamp next to it, and then it all has been preserved that way. So, anybody else have a question? Uh huh. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. The rock there is kind of sedentary. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what it is exactly the earth like it might be chert that has been weathered or it might be limestone that has been weathered because once any amount of water a lot easier to break apart. I mean, it's still too hard for your tiller, right? But they get soft enough to shatter and to break. Um, and so that might be, it might be what you're looking at. Yeah. 
especially if it's what's left on a hill, because with the ridge and valley, the reason it looks the way it does, right, is because you had these certain layers of rock that weathered a lot faster than the other ones. And so what's left behind on the ridges, anywhere that's high, is the harder the harder rocks, right? Your harder sedimentary rocks. And then the ones that are the softer ones that weather better are what gets washed away and left and are gone. So if you're sitting up high, you're probably on something pretty hard, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. That means you got some limestone hanging out somewhere that's just getting washed away by that water. Just gets washed away. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of sinkholes. Mm -hmm. What happens is that the as rainwater seeps through, it gets slightly acidic. Just a little bitty bit acidic. And then that reacts with the calcium carbonate in the limestone and breaks it apart, right? So then the CO2, the, cal the carbonate part, gets to escape, right, and go off as of CO2. And the calcium is all that, gets, all that gets left behind. But it doesn't take up as much space anymore. And so it just gets eaten through and ends up making those, those holes. It's like all of Florida is just a giant coral reef pretending to be land, right? It was, it was Africa, and then a coral reef was on top of it. And now theoretically it's rock, but it just it just disappears anytime you look at it wrong. So <laughs> you guys have any other questions? Thank you. Oh well thank you guys so much for coming. I've got um if, if you guys want a rock, you can take some of my chert home with you. You are welcome to it. I have a lot. Do you need a piece of Bartow chert? Thank you. Like I said, it's from Adairsville and Kingston. So <laughs> We did work hard for it. I carried a very large rock up a very large hill. I almost fell in the creek bed. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, just a couple announcements. We don't have any evening program in May for the Barton History Museum, so we don't have anything going on there. But we do have our next Lunch and Learn that's happening on June 15th. Ms. Linda Kellogg, who a lot of you in the community might know her. She's been a really big proponent uh, in the community for a long time with the Parkville High School. She'll be here discussing um, her work in the community doing Martin Luther King celebrations here. So make sure that you all come out for that if you don't can. So thank you again for coming. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Cool rocks. <laughs>